I invite you to take your Bibles out and join with me in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. We are coming upon the concluding words of this incredible book. Last week, we looked at three verses. This morning, we look at one. (laughs) One verse. Can you believe it? All right, but this is an incredible verse that is in the Scripture for us today. I want to begin by giving you some information that was released in a Time Magazine article that was entitled, The Hollowing of America. A guy by the name of John Leo reviewed a book called An Immodest Agenda, Rebuilding America Before the 21st Century. And in his review, he made a special note of an alarming conclusion the author had come to regarding marriage. I want you just to listen to this. In this book, he sees the egocentric mentality as the chief villain rooted in American individualism, but disastrously pushed along by the countercultural self-psychologies of Abraham Maslow and others. He argues that attitudes unleashed since the 60s have so corroded America's life that no political or economic renewal is possible unless those attitudes are changed. He went and said that he found that 17% of Americans are deeply committed to a philosophy of self-fulfillment, a feeling that ego needs, sensation and excitement to take priority over work and the needs of others including spouse and children. The all-consuming desire is to please self. Another 63%, who the author calls an ambivalent majority, embrace the self-centered philosophy in varying degrees. That they also hold on to old beliefs that those things are important. But it does not belly the fact that 80% of Americans have been affected by the new mentality of selfishness. In the age of ego, marriage is often less an emotional bonding than a breakable alliance between self-seeking individuals, unquote. From this article, it seems that the hollowing of America can be at least partially attributed to the rotting of the American family. We know that we are in a tailspin as we think of the American family. You only need to go to schools where you're dealing with many generational individuals that are dealing with second and third marriages, stepchildren from three, now on an average, three different households. Kids are really the byproduct of selfish decisions. I remember years ago, I used to be a photographer, as some of you know, and I did commercial photography and wedding photography. Wedding photography was something that was a lot of fun back in the days before I became a Christian. What would happen oftentimes, not the majority, or not all the time, but most of the time, I would say, when I would do a wedding, it was kind of like the ceremony itself was just a, a formality. You had to get through that so you could get to the reception. And I remember being with these people and we'd photograph and do all of this kind of stuff and you had to wait for a long time because after the quick ceremony, which usually wasn't more than 10 to 15 minutes, these individuals would ride around drinking alcohol and by the time they got to the reception area, which was usually about an hour and a half later on average, they would come in totally drunk. It was all about the party. And it's amazing as I look back on many of the weddings that I photographed, very few of them are still going strong today. In fact, I remember teaching in our Sunday school class back at Calvary Church. We had a singles ministry, but we also had a blended families ministry. And our classroom was usually about 75 people, and all of those folks in that class were second marriages, sometimes third. And as Shelley and I had checked back over many, many of the years, those guys coming to class, hearing the Bible being taught, applying the messages to the marital relationships, 
that only a few of those marriages are still together today. It is a shocking thing as we think about the institution of marriage. And by the way, once the core is destroyed, it's not long before the tree's fall is far behind. Because once you take God out of the equation of anything in life, it becomes a disaster. In God's eyes, marriage is honorable. He established it at creation. He honored it ever since. In much of the world today, marriage is anything but honored. In fact, as we're going to look at in a moment, the new thing is shacking up. This is the new accepted ideal, which, by the way, is a total affront to the sanctity of marriage. To live in cohabitation with someone who is not your wife or husband is something that is detrimental not only to the kids that are brought up into that, but also to a watching world. I can guarantee you something that this is not going to be what I would consider positive uh, popular preaching. Uh, if you don't want big churches, just preach about marriage and uh, the whole issue of staying together and not living together. It's not long before people that are doing that don't come anymore. But it's interesting. A great many couples who do marry do so as a temporary convenience, not as a social, much less a divine requirement for their living together. The Apostle Paul warns that in the last days, apostate teachers will forbid marriage. In fact, if you look behind me in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, we see these words. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their conscience are dead. They will say it is wrong to be married and abstain from eating certain foods. So there are two extremes. There are those that forbid marriage because they think that somehow it's a holier way of getting to God. And then there's some that dismiss it completely and say that there's really no need for marriage. After all, it's just a piece of paper. And so we have an, an issue where honorable marriage is not happening. But I want you to notice that God holds marriage not only to be permissible, but it is to be done in a way that honors God. It is a high regard, and this is meant to be a divine institution where the gospel is reflected through the imagery of marriage. Now, I know what you're thinking. In the Bible, you see these people like Jacob and David and Solomon, and they have all of these wives, not just one, but sometimes 15. I think Solomon was credited with how many? 600 and some wives. None of them understood him either. But then besides that, they, they had what's called concubines. I mean, good grief. It's hard enough to keep one wife satisfied. I can't imagine trying to keep 600. And then you got the concubines that were just basically looked at as a pleasure, something that you had. And women were regarded as a very low thing. And you're wondering, how did God deal with that? Here's David, a man after God's own heart, and yet he had all of these wives. Well, we understand that there was always a problem and an issue with individuals who married more than one wife. It was never God's ideal. It was one man, one woman for a lifetime. And when that got messed up, everything in their lives got skewed. You can look back at every single person in the Bible that had more than one wife, and there was always an issue, always a problem. Now, I want to begin by sizing up the scene in a realistic appraisal before we begin to start looking at the text this morning. So let's, let's look at this together. The home is the basic unit of our society. In fact, it's axiomatic that a nation is only as strong as its homes. Listen to this carefully. A society is only as strong as its homes. And in your notes, enough weak and broken homes add to a weak and broken nation. 
You remember when we were going through the Francis Schaeffer, How Should We Then Live series about the breaking up of a nation happens by disregarding and downplaying the family. Let's take a look at it. The home was once the anvil upon which, look at these, convictions were hammered out, character was formed, credence is developed, that's a belief and a trust. And over the past two or three decades, the institution of marriage has been taking quite a heavy beating. It's been bashed on by the talk shows. It's been battered and disrespected on the big screen. It's being redefined by a perverse culture. Never did we think we'd come to the day. It was bad enough that people were having premarital sex, but now same sex and all of the other things that have just been on an absolute spiral. Now, let's take a look at this. There's a marriage chart that I want you to take a look at behind me to give us a little bit of perspective. Back in the day, if you see the blue there, there used to be those that believed that having at least an appearance of having a civil union relationship by a clergy was something that was fairly steady. People would go to church, whether they were Christians or not Christians, they at least had the outward look of something that was in a church. And as you can see, this is kind of an old actual um, diagram. You can see the trend as it moves down, where people now are not even using clergy anymore. Do you know that in the state of Michigan, you do not have to be a licensed clergy to marry someone? It can be a brother. It can be a nephew. It can be anybody you want. There is no longer a necessity for an ordained clergy to perform a wedding ceremony. I was shocked. But that's the way it is. And so now what is happening, if people even do go into the idea of marriage, instead of trying to bring God into the marriage, they'll just have a brother or a relative just stand up and say something that has nothing to do with God. And folks, this is very serious. If you'll take a look here, this is another chart that might blow your mind, marital and non-marital unions. Look at the gray there. That is those that are cohabitating. The one that's at the bottom, of course, are those that are uh, going through the difficulties of marriage and separation. Over there to the left, you got there the idea of married and separated, and then those that are going through divorce. This This is a terrible thing here. And by the way, I would suggest that when you look at divorce, it's so much more than that because many of the divorces are third-time divorces, sometimes four times. And so it is not an over-exaggeration to say that America's institution is at a crisis. In fact, it's way beyond a crisis. It's interesting how all of these things can happen. I want to explain this in your notes. Two wrecking balls. You got the idea of what a wrecking ball is. A wrecking ball that have pounded the home are identified as two things. Number one, marital infidelity. The second one is material idolatry. Now what we're going to do today is we are going to look at the first one. We are going to look at the marriage union. Next week we are going to look at the material idolatry idolatry. All of these things combined break up the family unit. Part one, we are looking on commitment in marriage. And then next week, we're going to be dealing with contentment with material things. Remember Francis Schaeffer's word, personal peace and affluency. Those are the two values of America. Personal peace says, I want to be left alone. Let me do my own thing. Don't mess with me. And then affluence is the idea of accumulating stuff. Things that will somehow make me happy or give me some type of fulfillment. So let's take a look here at what God says about the scriptural analysis of marriage. Now listen to this very carefully, folks. This is very, very important. God honored marriage through each one of the persons of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
are all represented inside the marriage unit. And I would also say that when it comes to a person receiving salvation, all three people are part of the process of a person coming to faith in Christ. God choosing them before the foundation of the world, Christ securing their salvation by paying for the sin on the cross, and then, of course, the Holy Spirit that opens the heart to receive Christ. All three persons of the Trinity are involved in the whole process of salvation. So it is with the marital union. Now, let's take a look at it. God honored marriages through each of these. Again, look at your notes. God established it through what we call a covenant. A covenant is nothing less than a union or a contract between two people. And so God, in a covenant of marriage, says that you are coming before a holy God, making not just a promise, but a vow. A vow to say, Lord, I am mirroring the image of salvation through my marital relationship. Look at the next one. <clears throat> Jesus honored marriage by performing at his first miracle. It was at a wedding. You remember the wedding in Cana. The third one, the Holy Spirit honored marriage by using it then to picture the church, the ecclesia in the New Testament. And so the whole Trinity testifies that marriage is honorable. No person, therefore, is justified in disparaging marriage. Now, Scripture gives at least three reasons for marriage. And I want you to notice this carefully with me. Number one, he designed it for the propagation of marriage. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, if you'll notice it behind me, look at the words. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. The very first command that God gave for marriage was to produce children. Notice number two. Number two, marriage was given as a means of preventing sexual sin. I remember speaking with a gentleman that was a marriage counselor, and he says the number one strongest urge in the human body is to procreate. So for a man or a woman, the desire is to come together in this union. And the problem that we have is that desire is so strong that people do that act outside of marriage. And so Paul gives instructions on what to do. The first one in Genesis 2.18, <coughs> excuse me, there are a couple of things. When the Lord God said, this is not good, it's not good that the man should be alone, I will make a helper who is just right for him, right? Notice the next one, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. So Paul understands that if that desire becomes too strong, God gives an out. And the out is, is that a person is to get married. In fact, Paul talks about burning with lust, and that is to be satisfied within marriage. And then number three, marriage is a symbol of headship, which models the church. You can see the whole process Again, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, judge for yourselves, is, uh, is it right for a woman to pray in public without a covering for her head? So God set up parameters about headship. And then he goes on, then in uh, Ephesians, for a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. So immediately you see the correlation between marriage and the church. Let's take a look at this. As we begin, I want to draw your attention to our one verse that we're going to look at. 
And what we're going to see is that God gives three imperatives and a warning that reads like kind of a skull and crossbone label that is on a jar, kind of the thing that says harmful or fatal if swallowed. Take a look at verse 4. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. There it is. That's the text. That is what we are going to work through this morning. So let's begin with marriage and honor. The word honor, as we begin to look at it within this text, is the fact that it says we are to give it specifically to marriage. The word honor is the word timas, and it means valuable, costly, precious. It is something that is esteemed. It is something that is to be placed on a high priority. In fact, it's got the idea of in comparison to something else. This marital relationship is to be honored. Question, why? Why is honor given here as a command for marriage? Because of what we've just said, God's name, listen to this carefully, is attached to every single marital union. It is a description of what God has instituted where a man and a woman come and create a beautiful picture of salvation. Now, isn't it just like Satan to try to mess it up? It's just like Satan to come up and say, how can I pervert what God has put together? And I could say that in our society, not only has it been perverted with shacking up, premarital sex, whatever you want to call it, now it has escalated to the fact where now you go beyond what is even normal in human relationships. Two women, two men, whatever it might be. There could be nothing more insulting to the God of grace than to take something that he has created that is so beautiful and supposed to be so profound and pervert it and drag it through the mud. This is the kind of outlook that we need to have when you come to a text like this. Honor means it is to be safeguarded. It means it is to be taken very seriously. Now look at the text. Give honor to marriage. Here is the command to honor marriage that's directed at those who dishonored it in two opposite ways. Now, it's going to be a cultural thing, and yet some of the things still apply today. There are two things that are noted. One is called asceticism. We'll explain that in a moment. And libertinism. Okay? So the first thing is, the asceticism is where they set out for moral perfection. Asceticism is one that says, we will not have sex, we will not get married. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church has jumped upon that one as somehow a way of to have bigger and better holiness, is to be set apart, monastic. And of course, the, libertine, the libertinism is this idea where it's unbridled sexual restraints. If it feels good, do it. And there are some churches, one particular one in Grand Rapids, that actually has that as their motto. Unbridled sexual deviance. Anything goes. And of course, we know that those that live under the authority of God's word realize that marriage, divinely appointed ordinance of God, Notice in your notes, God says that that marriage must be honored and revered. Honored and revered. So the Holy Spirit honored marriage by portraying it in a relationship of Christ and his church. Hold your place in the book of Hebrews and turn back to the book of Ephesians and chapter 5. The book of Ephesians and chapter 5. The wives are going to like this passage in particular. 
Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 21. And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your... Now, in our translation, it doesn't put it in there, but it's in the original, your own husbands as to the Lord. The word own for own husbands is the word idios in the Greek. So you could say, wives, submit to your idiot husbands. That's what the text says. Now, the word idiot here means peculiar. <clears throat> it means something that is specific. But it says there, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For a husband, look at this carefully, is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Notice the parallel. He is the Savior of his body, the church. Now look at this. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. Well, how did he love the church? Self-sacrificially. He died, right? He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies, and then he gives the example. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. Again, the parallel. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother, he is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And then he goes on and explains that this is a mystery. But this is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, the only thing that the text says at this point is that the marriage relationship is a model of subjection, just like the church. And what it is saying here is that Jesus himself is the savior of the body. The supreme, ultimate model of submission is Jesus Christ himself, who performed the supreme act of submission. Remember in the garden? Lord, not my will, but yours be done. He did the ultimate sacrifice. And all of that was to honor the sanctity of marriage through the illustration of salvation. Now, Christ is the Savior of the body, his church, for whom he died on the cross. He is a perfect provider. He's a perfect protector. He's the head of his church, which is his body. Now, Jesus Christ, being that divine role model, is providing in a very tangible way. Look at Colossians 2.19 behind me. Christ is the head of the body. He holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. Look at that imagery. You have a beautiful picture that is painted on a human body. It is the idea of all of the different parts working together to unite together the understanding of marriage. It's our responsibility then to protect, to preserve the institution of marriage. So how do we do that? How is it that we are to honor marriage? What is it specifically that he's getting at? Now, I got to warn you, we're going to be going into some very strange territory. And some of these things you're going to think are just crazy. Or what in the world is that doing in the Bible? That's what we're going to find out. Let's look at marriage and purity. Look at the text again. Remain faithful to one another in marriage. Pretty simple statement. Obviously, to honor marriage is to remain faithful. Otherwise, the, the, they wouldn't have to begin to do it. They're continuing to do it. 
So this is exactly what's happening. Now, I like the New American Standard rendering a little bit better. It's on the, it's on the screen. Look at Let the marriage bed be undefiled. That is how it literally reads in the Greek. The marriage bed. What in the world is the Holy Spirit trying to explain there with that simple statement? Well, let me give you what the actual word is. Undefiled simply is an interesting word that says aminatos. Aminatos. Free from contamination. Something that is unsoiled. Something that is pure. Now listen to this carefully. At this point, it is not talking about blatant committing of adultery sexually. It is talking about protecting the marriage in such a way that that wife is to be protected and pure from the things that she sees, the things that she is exposed to. The husband is to guard his wife from temptation. By the way, the exact opposite of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. All of a sudden, you see this woman talking to a serpent, and he's having a conversation with her. And where is Adam? Adam's just kind of back there saying, hey, I'm just kind of seeing what you're going to say here, honey. And then all of a sudden, before he knows it, he's credited with the sin. He was supposed to be protecting his wife. He was supposed to be guarding her from anything that would be impure. So a husband's primary responsibility is to make sure his wife is sheltered in purity with the things that she watches, the things that she goes to, the things she's involved in, and the husband is to watch over and to protect. So this is something that is very serious. Look at your notes, a little bit more detail. The bed in this context, the Greek is referring it to the altar of the marital union. So when you see the word bed there, it's really in the understanding of an altar. The bed is the altar upon which the husband and wife are there in their marital union. The marriage bed, the altar, is to be kept free, look at your notes, from sexual immorality. Why? Look at your notes. Because our bodies are actually knitted together with Christ. So let me explain this. We're going to explain a little bit about what sexual immorality is. The idea of sexual immorality is anything that is impure. That would mean uh, that would that would mean sex outside of marriage. It would mean adultery. It would mean same sex sex all of those would be classified as sexual immorality. Now turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The book of 1 Corinthians. Maybe you've never thought of your marriage as actually something that is tied to Jesus Christ. Do you realize this morning that your bodies right now, if you're a Christian, If you're a Christian, your body does not belong to you. It belongs to Christ. You cannot do with your body anything you feel like doing. It's not your body. In fact, that body, as we're going to look at, has been bought. And that body has been bought with a pretty huge price. Take a look at verse 15 of chapter 6. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? The idea there is to get a shock value. Never! And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say the two are united into one, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Look at this. Run! from sexual sin. This is incredible. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. 
For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. It can't get any clearer than that, folks. You can't mix this verse around to try to make it say something else. It's simply you go outside the parameters of the sexual union between husband and wife, and you have violated, you have literally taken Christ and dragged him through the mud. I think if people thought about that, maybe those that even have an appearance of Christianity would be able to say, you know, I ought not to do that. So this is an incredible thing. All throughout the Bible, Israel's lack of faithfulness to God has always been seen in the term spiritual adultery. In fact, we're going to look at some things here that are going to just be incredible. Sexual immorality, again, is the word for fornication in the Bibles. It's the word porneia in the Greek. We get our word pornography from that word. Pornos. Look at this in your notes. Porneia or pornos is a strong word that works to distort God's work of marriage. Remember, Satan is on a mission to distort the beauty of marriage. Now, all throughout the Bible, again, I want you to remember this very carefully today. God always used sexual immorality to describe the relationship that Israel was giving to God. She was constantly going out on God. The book of Hosea is a parable basically about a wife that continues to go out and have sexual immorality with other people and how God had to buy her back. So all throughout the Bible, we hear that God is a jealous God. Uh, I don't want to get too far into this, but there's nothing that rips at a marriage than to be jealous for a spouse who is unfaithful. I am so thankful I have never experienced that. I know many have. To a spouse that has been unfaithful, and now they have to deal with the feelings of rejection and all of the things that go along with it. And that jealousy is actually a mark of being made in God's image. Let me explain this. God is talked about as being jealous. Take a look, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Now think of this in the marriage relationship. You have a spouse that's got affections for somebody else. So he says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Look at the next one. You must worship no other gods. That would be adultery. For the Lord, look at this, whose very name is Jealous, with a capital J. That's a name. That's a description of who God is. Whose very name is Jealous is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. The New Living Translation is so beautiful here. He is jealous about his relationship with you. So folks, this morning, listen to this carefully. God is jealous about your relationship and my relationship. In other words, he looks at my relationship and he says, don't have affections for anything other than me. Because if you do, it is now a violation. This This is a terrible thing. In fact, let me, I gotta take you to this. God is so serious about faithfulness in marriage he wrote a very bizarre scripture for a man who was jealous about his wife's faithfulness. Never thought you'd see this in the Bible. Turn to Numbers chapter 5, the book of Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And find, if you will, chapter 5. It's kind of a long text, but I want you to kind of see what's happening here. 
I used to think that a jealous husband, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no thing in scripture that would ever tolerate jealousy from a husband. But look at this, Numbers chapter five, verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, give the following instruction for the people of Israel. Suppose a man's wife goes astray and she is unfaithful to her husband and has had sex with another man, but neither her husband nor anyone else knows about it. She has defiled herself even though there was no witness and she was not caught in the act. If her husband becomes jealous and is suspicious about his wife and needs to know whether or not she has defiled herself, the husband must bring his wife to the priest. He must also bring an offering of two quarts of barley flour to be presented on her behalf. Verse 16, the priest will then present her to stand before trial before the Lord. He must take some holy water in a clay jar poured into the dust that he has taken from the tabernacle floor. When the priest has presented the woman before the Lord, he must unbind her hair, place in her hands the offering of proof, the jealousy offering, to determine whether her husband's suspicions are justified. The priest will stand before her holding the jar of bitter water that brings a curse to those who are guilty. The priest will then put the woman under the oath and say to her, if no other man has had sex with you and you have not gone astray and defiled yourself while under your husband's authority, may you be immune from the effects of this bitter water. Can you imagine a woman that was guilty? All of a sudden she's got this water. Look at this. But if you have gone astray by being unfaithful to your husband and have been defiled yourself by having sex with another man. At this point, the priest was put the woman under the oath, saying, may the people know that the Lord's curse is upon you when he makes you infertile, causing your womb to shrivel and your abdomen to swell. Now you're looking at this thinking, what in the world is this all about? It is not a justification for a man to be jealous. Let me start off by saying that. Now today in our culture and in, in the Christianity, we have the Holy Spirit. That is, that is inside of us. But at this time, God was so serious about making sure that the jealousy that would come over a man, and I know this was a weird culture because women were not viewed very highly, that this would be something that would determine whether or not a wife had gone astray. Why? Because God knew what it's like to feel jealousy. And let me just up the ante a little bit. This is about physical adultery, right? God says that the moment you share your affections, spiritually speaking, with anything else, job, family, ministry, anything that seems to take away first affection for him, we are in violation of being guilty before a jealous God. Adultery is not simply just the act of worshiping other gods. It's putting anything else ahead of God. And again, that's a variety of different things. Things that get in the way of our first priority of making God the first thing. So moving on here, sexual immorality can never be contained to simple physical consequences because it's not merely a physical act. Look at this chart here. We'll go through this very quickly. It involves the whole person with body and emotions, with the will and the spirit. It affects the whole person. The memory becomes permanently etched, those of us who have a memory of past adultery. So that memory becomes permanently etched with the experience, the conscience becomes seared, and the spirit becomes polluted. This is why sexual immorality is so serious. It doesn't just affect two people. It literally affects all members of the Trinity. All members of the Trinity are affected by our marriage relationship. Isn't that incredible? That's why the text says that if you leave a, heart, a, a hurt in the heart of a woman... Your prayers will be hindered. The reason for that is because the Trinity is involved in your relationship. So that brings us to see marriage and judgment. Look at the text now back in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. And again, the writer names two things that destroy the sanctity of sexual marriage, adultery and fornication. 
Again, adultery is a specific term that refers to extramarital relations, where fornication is a more general term that includes all forms of sexual immorality. And both of those incur God's judgment. When we hear about God's judgment, we naturally think of fire and brimstone. But that can't be with a Christian. So what does it mean for the Christian to receive judgment? If you remember the fact that David was a man after God's own heart, how does a Christian receive God's judgment? We don't have time to go in here, but you'll see the slide. Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Just read those two. And you'll hear how David says, until I confessed my sin, it was like in the summertime when I had no energy. Until I was able to freely confess what I have done to you, God, it was against you and you only that I sinned. David understood that his sin just didn't affect all of the people like Uriah. His, his sin affected his relationship with God. So much so that he pours his heart out to God and says, Forgive me. I have sinned against you. Look at your notes. The judgment of God upon a Christian then is what David experienced, a broken spirit, a spirit that yearns to have back the closeness and intimacy that he had with God, and then a contrite heart, a heart that yearns at wanting reconciliation with God. And that brings you to the next one in your notes. The things that David <clears throat> was experiencing about his sin with a judgment of God upon his conscience. It affected him, by the way, folks, spiritually and physically. It affected David spiritually and physically. Let me give you one more scripture here, the ultimate consequence of God's judgment. For those who think that shacking up premarital sex is no big deal, let's take a look at what Galatians 5 says. Galatians chapter 5. It's not just something that everybody's doing in the culture. There's some real, real radical consequences for this. Chapter 5, verse 16, I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing <clears throat> what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Those two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not un un under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, look at this now, he gives a list. I'll explain it to you. There's a one that needs to be clarified. The results are very clear. Sexual immorality, that's what we've been talking about, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, the word sorcery there is the Greek word pharmakeia, means drugs, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Now look at the warning. Let me tell you again as I have before that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't get any clearer than that. This isn't fire and brimstone preaching. It's just simply reading God's word here, right? It says that those that do these things, if you're shacking up, having premarital sex, guess what? It's an indication that it is not well with your soul and that you need salvation, that you need to come to Christ for forgiveness. So that brings us finally to heeding God's counsel, the scriptural answer. What does it take to obey God's command about marriage? Well, really, the answer is you are to stay committed. Commitment to purity. By the way, Job made this commitment to moral purity in these words. Look at it. Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. Why did he make that vow? He knew that the problem was not the first look, it's the second look. The problem was is it was going to get him into trouble. So as we close, two things I think will help us to stay committed. And I think by doing this, it honors the marriage relationship. Number one, we honor marriage when. 
We honor marriage when we see it as a picture of salvation. Number two, we honor marriage by guarding ourselves from sexual sin. We are to take care of each other, our husbands and wives. If something that they're going to watch or hear or be around is going to be a a trap or going to be something that's going to cause someone to stumble, then we better protect it. That's what Jesus was talking about, about taking radical action, about gouging out his right eye. He wasn't literally saying that. He's basically saying take radical action to make sure that you don't fall into this sin. Stay away from certain things. Number two, we dishonor marriage. We dishonor marriage when we follow the culture's perverted values. We know what those are. The second one, We dishonor marriage by having sexual relations outside of the marriage covenant. Because all a person is doing at that moment is spreading Satan's hatred for Almighty God and for the sanctification of marriage. We need to remember that all sin begins in the mind, and this means that we have to guard ourselves from sexual sin. We have to judge it, turn from it, the moment it enters our mind. If God's word is true, and it is, the culture is in moral darkness, and it is when the darkness is greatest that the light really, folks, shines the brightest. If we will maintain God's standards of moral purity, we're going to be able to shine in this dark world. And I know the people out there don't get it. They don't understand it. But let me also say, for those who have entered into the dishonoring things of marriage, the good news today is that there's forgiveness. The good news today is that there's a cross. And all it is needed is simply to come before the Lord, repent of the sin, and ask for Christ's forgiveness. And the Bible says that he will never reject those who come to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news of forgiveness this morning. The good news that God has ordained marriage, and it is a precious thing, not to be minimized, not to be devalued by the system of this world. And first of all, Father, I pray for those this morning that do not have a relationship with you, those that are living dishonorable lives of disobedience. We pray that the power of your Holy Spirit will come upon them and give them the desire to repent while there's still time. And Father, I pray for those of us who are here, maybe those that are not yet married and those that are married, I pray, Father, that you will help us to gain a clearer understanding of what marriage is and how it is to be protected. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. And we ask all of this in the precious name of Christ, our Savior and Lord, and all of God's people together said, amen.